Welcome to the Observer's Direct, the show where we go meet our observers in person. This week we head to Guinea in West Africa with our observer Fude Kouyaté. Now Guinea is rich in gold deposits and there's a real gold rush going on in the east. Tens of thousands of Guineans are digging, hoping to strike it rich. But our observer Fude says that this is damaging the environment and not bringing much money to the region. We head to the wild, wild east with my colleague Julien Pang. Hi, Fode. Hi, how are you? It's good to see you. Thanks. I wanted to tell you about the gold mining here in Upper Guinea. Everyone was talking about the gold rush a few years ago. And now a lot of people are coming here looking for gold. Some have made a lot of money, and it's boosted the income of local communities, which is a good thing. It's changed a lot of people's lives. But there is also a negative aspect. What are your concerns? People rarely talk about the downside of gold mining and the environmental and ecological impact in particular. There has been significant environmental deterioration in this region. And you're worried? Yes, I'm worried. Ferdi, would you be able to show me around some of these mines? Absolutely. Let's go. You lead the way. We head to the village of Doko, which is full of gold miners. A surreal landscape, every meter of earth dug and prospected. With thousands of men and women working to extract the precious metal from the ground. Pickaxes, ropes, buckets, methods that are 400 years old. Bonjour. Hello, how are you? Hello, I'm Mamadou Kondi. To find gold, you have to go down the mine. Then we dig with our pickaxes. We put the earth in the buckets and we bring it back up to ground level. The shaft is as deep as three men standing on top of one another. There are two tunnels at the bottom. With the main hole, they make up what we call the foot of the mine. There are two teams of men and women working in shifts. The men dig, and the women pull up the buckets. One woman keeps count. Each stone represents one bucket. This ensures everyone gets their fair share. There are two to three meters between each opening. Tunnels go off in opposite directions at the bottom of each pit. One to the right, one to the left. They're supported by logs. However, the ground is so full of holes that sometimes there are cave-ins. Like here, miners are killed in accidents like this every year. But people in Sigiri are desperately poor, so fear is not an option. It's dangerous because you're going underground. You know it's dangerous, but you have to be brave. Once the buckets are brought back up, the earth is taken to be crushed and washed to extract the gold. Can you show me how it's done? We put it in here. It's crushed and then the earth with the gold comes out here. We then put it through the rinsing machine. Before taking it over to the women, who will wash it thoroughly and sift for gold. And where is all the water coming from? It comes from over there, from the stream down there. So you're using water from underground. What will you do when the water runs out? We should be OK for this year. But in two to three years' time, we will run dry. What will you do then? We'll find another spot. Digging is not the only way to find gold. Many people use metal detectors, like here on the Malian border.
Hello. Sometimes we'll dig. But before we dig the pits, we check the earth. If the detector beeps, I call my friend over and he helps me dig. If there's a small amount of gold, it will beep. If it made a lot of noise, then we'd be very happy. What will you do once you've finished here? We'll go somewhere else, find a new site. You'll leave all this and go somewhere else? Yes, that's right. And how many sites have you prospected already? Several dozen, I'm not quite sure. The environmental impact here is probably worse. They're only digging the surface, but it's over kilometers of land. Nothing grows here afterwards. Gold has kept Sagiri going for hundreds of years. It generates a lot of money, and yet there is still no basic framework regulating this activity. As far as the state is concerned, gold mining is like an impenetrable fortress. The state receives no money from gold mining revenue. It's managed on a local level. There are mine chiefs called tombalomas, and they answer to local chiefs. So it's the local chiefs making the money? Of course. The Tombalombas answer to the chiefs and they share the money. But the people, they want roads built. They're not happy, not at all. Hi, how are you? Good, thanks. We need tarmac roads here. Siguri has potential. There is money to be made here. But no one knows anything about managing money. I won't lie to you, people have had enough. Gold is mined in and around Sagiri using methods that are centuries old. A few kilometers away, they are using the latest technology. This open pit belongs to the SAG, a subsidiary of the Anglo Gold Ashanti Group, based in Johannesburg. The main shareholders are American pension funds. Massive equipment is used here and the annual turnover amounts to hundreds of millions of dollars. It does have something in common with artisanal gold mining, however, a devastating impact on the environment and on water resources in particular, as one of the employees confirms in no uncertain terms. The water level drops the more we excavate. I don't quite understand. You need a lot of water to... No, no, no. We need to drain the water in order to work the land. We are drying up the land. So you are draining off the water? That's right. The SAG processes a gold-bearing gravel in a factory a few hundred meters away from its quarries. They use a chemical process to extract the gold from the tons of rocks involving cyanide. The chemical process, the leaching, begins in these vats. The gold is dissolved in the cyanide solution and separated from the ore. That's what the cyanide is for, to dissolve the gold. What happens to the remains? Where is the liquid kept? We have a tailing pond seven kilometers away. Where is it? It's over on the other side, seven kilometers away. It's a tailing pond. The cyanide will decompose naturally in the sunlight. And don't forget, we add hydrogen peroxide, which is an oxidant, will destroy the cyanide. Do you think the water stored there poses a threat? It is harmless. We have done a lot of testing since we started working here, and we have never found any cyanide in the water. Residents in nearby villages are very concerned, however. They say nearby rivers and streams were polluted with cyanide in July 2013, which a SAG strongly denies. And it's not just the cyanide proving to be a cause for concern. Did this used to be a quarry? Yes, an old SAG quarry. They don't use it anymore. They just abandoned it? Yes, they left it like that. It's not the only one. They didn't fill it up? No, they took what they could from the quarries, and then they left. Since coming here, they've only refilled one quarry. That's right, just one. This man's keen to show us a dried up riverbed where water used to flow.
There used to be a river here that never ran dry. The source was just behind us, but it stopped flowing three years ago. It's the Sag's fault for drawing water upstream, and the smaller gold producers also wrecked it. It used to be beautiful here. There were forests, caimans, porcupines, hyenas, all sorts of animals. Despite being rich in gold, bauxite and diamonds, Guinea is one of the ten poorest countries in the world. Tens of thousands of people make a living from the mines in Seguri, but most of the money falls into the hands of large mining companies and village chiefs. We wanted to speak to an official from Conakry's mining ministry, but no one seemed to have the time. I'll let him know you're here. Merci. Thanks. I'm really sorry, he's gone out. I thought he was here, I was mistaken. So he's not here? No, I went into his office to check, but he's not there. The Ghanaian government says it wants to take action, but seems powerless, with the traditional village chiefs on one side and big mining companies on the other the authorities are finding it impossible to implement a sustainable system to protect the environment. Vaudé is afraid the mines will run dry and that the big companies will leave. Human greed will then leave a desert behind where nothing will grow anymore. We're going to stay in touch with Vaudé to see if the Guinean authorities find a way to regulate the mining. Now, if there's a problem in your community that you think the world needs to know about, get in touch, and maybe we'll come see you for the next episode of Observers Direct.